Thanks, Rachel. Okay, good evening. My name is Margot Armstrong, also known to uh, some of you as Jill. I'm a longtime board member of Elephant Artist Relief Society, also known as EAR, and part of EAR's programming committee. First, I'd like to begin tonight in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth by honoring and acknowledging Mokinstis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, including the Siksika, Kanai, Pigani, as well as the Ayaxi, Nakoda, and the Tsutana nations. Ear acknowledges that this territory is also cherished by the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We celebrate all nations, Indigenous and non, who honor this land. We are grateful to engage in an honest and eager process of reconciliation. We are all treaty people. On behalf of EAR and the EAR leadership team, I'd like to officially welcome you to EAR's annual grad school talk. We're grateful to each of you for choosing to spend your evening with us. Thank you for being here. This evening's talk is, is one of an ongoing series of EAR events called Umbrella Talks. EAR's primary purpose is to empower artists in Calgary and area to survive and thrive as artists. And these umbrella talks are one element of what we offer. This year, EAR celebrates 15 years of service to the local arts community. And even though EAR has grown and evolved over that time, our mission has remained the same, to provide practical resources that help sustain the livelihood and practice of artists in the Calgary area. To achieve this, EAR offers monthly professional and personal development talks such as this one. Also, a twice monthly online artist meetup through Facebook called Studio E, a wide variety of community resource information, which you can find on our website, elephantartistrelief.com. And of course, our core program of emergency financial relief for artists who find themselves in a crisis situation. As a charitable organization, we rely sub substantially on you, the public, in the form of volunteerism, membership, and fundraising to do what we do. You can help us by raising awareness about EAR, and if you can, please consider donating online. Our heartfelt thanks go out to all those who have already gifted EAR in the past. The Society is 15 years old this year, and we're encouraging our supporters to contribute a monthly donation of $15 to mark this anniversary. Every dollar donated is allocated to providing relief for artists in times of need. Just one more thing before we start. Throughout the presentation, we ask that you keep your mics on mute and also please turn off your cameras so there's minimal background interference. Please feel free though to use the chat box to write any questions you have as they come up and we'll start a record of those for the Q&A portion of the evening. Um, after the presentation tonight, we'll have a five minute break, um, at which point there will be um, a feedback questionnaire, uh, a link to a feedback questionnaire put into the chat. So if you could follow that and fill it out, um, the feedback we get from people at our events is extremely valuable for us. So if you could take the time to do that, that would be really appreciated. Anyway, before I pass you along to um, Marianne Elder, um, I'll tell you a little bit about her. Marianne is an education consultant based in Calgary, Alberta. She has been the administrative manager for Elephant Artist Relief Society in Calgary since 2019. She has over 16 years of experience in nonprofit art organizations and higher education and holds a Master of Fine Arts degree in studio art from the University of California, Irvine. Marianne's higher education experience includes eight years as the Associate Vice President, Student Affairs at, at AU Arts, overseeing recruitment, admissions, and student services. She spent six years as the program administrator for the MFA program at Claremont Graduate University in Claremont, California. She was the senior curator at the Art Gallery of Calgary, 
at the sorry at the Art Gallery of Calgary, gallery director at East and Peggy Phelps Galleries for the Claremont Colleges, collections manager for the Capital Collections Foundation USA, and served as an adjunct professor in graduate level arts and cultural management and museum studies program. She has developed professional practices workshops for emerging artists and guest lectured in colleges and universities throughout Southern California and Alberta. Marianne presented her first grad school talk for EAR in 2019. She's worked for EAR as our, admi our administrative uh, manager for almost three years, starting, just, starting with us just before COVID emerged. So thank you very much for Marianne for working as hard as you did to help us get through the pandemic. And now too, as you continue to support EAR as we move forward into the ongoing recovery. And now without further ado, I will pass you along to Marianne Elder. Hi, everybody. Um, it's just a small group tonight. So I'm actually happy to, um, if that's okay with Jill, I'm happy to field questions sort of as we go and also tailor it a little bit uh, to those who are in attendance in case you have specific um, questions or areas specifically that you're interested in. Um, I'll just, Jill did a lovely introduction for me, but just to give you an idea about who I am and why you should listen to me, which you shouldn't, you should always take as much information in as you can, and then, you know, sort of distill that. Um, and let me know if there's internet interruption, um, because that sometimes it gets laggy. Okay, so. I just want to say, mm -hmm. if you feel like you can accommodate that, if people are asking questions as you go, then I don't see why not, especially since we have a small group. I think that's that's a great idea. That's it's casual, but you know, might help yeah. with information absorption. <laughs> so yeah. okay, for sure. Okay. But you can also put questions into the chat if you like. So whatever works. Absolutely. Or you can use the okay. raise your hand feature on Zoom if that helps as well. Um, that's, that's great. Nice. Okay. So um, just a little bit about so my background. Um, in terms of higher education and graduate programs and within education, I was in charge of sort of overseeing the admissions policies for MFA programs, MA programs, and a PhD in cultural studies. So through that time, I got a lot of experience sort of looking at applications, developing the criteria for who we admitted and who we didn't, developing criteria for who we provided scholarships for and who we didn't, helping students navigate that application process and I've traveled all over North America and actually internationally as well, speaking to high school students about going to school on an undergraduate level. One of the things I'll say right off the bat is sometimes I use jargon and vernacular of a vocabulary that <clears throat> might see is specialized and I forget that sometimes. So call me out, feel free to uh, post in the chat or just speak up and let me know. If I say a word that you're like, well, I'm not exactly sure what she means by that because sometimes as much as you understand a word the way I'm using it, isn't that's not the context you understand it in. So for instance, one of the first things I'll talk about is I use the terms undergraduate for any bachelor's level education, or even, you know, we can talk about diploma or specialized sort of um, certificate programs. And then I use graduate education for anything master's level and above. I also use a term called terminal degree. And what that means is that is the highest degree you can achieve in that field. So right now, officially, the MFA is the highest degree you can achieve within the arts. There is PhD programs out there, but the terminal degree specifically speaks to, because once you get to higher level graduate degrees, it speaks to what qualifications you require in order to be a professor, in order to teach at the university and college level. So when you talk about a terminal degree, usually it's a PhD, but because of art, um, if the MFA is a terminal degree, which then qualifies you to teach at the college and university level. So just those couple things straight off the bat. <clears throat> of the people that are here today, are there any specific disciplines that um, you're interested in talking about? Is it more sort of a studio visual art type or is there dance or music or anything like that? Because I can also focus that way. That's a really good question. If anyone has any specific um, yeah for me i'm visual arts but also looking at potentially doing a double masters uh because i also have an undergrad degree in sociology okay we can absolutely talk about that 
Okay. And if there's any other disciplines besides visual arts, let me know. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's okay. That's fairly focused. So I'll keep it focused for you guys. So one of the first things we'll talk about is why, why would we go to grad school? Um, and also my next question is, are you guys looking specifically at grad school? Because I won't talk about undergraduate school then at that point, except for how to qualify to get into graduate school. So if there's, you know, if there's a discussion needed about undergraduate, I'm happy to. So the first thing you're gonna look at is why in the world would you want a graduate degree in art? Well, <clears throat> there's lots of good reasons, but that has to be a reason for you. The number one thing you should keep in mind is what is it you want to do? And what I always tell people is think about it in terms of big dreams. You got to go big first. You don't want to start small. You want to start big and then, you know, retool it for your circumstances or needs. So if you look at let's dream big and I'm just going to use some crazy sort of dream big ideas. Let's say you want to represent Canada at the Venice Biennale. Um, let's say you're a sculptor, you want to re re represent Canada, the Venice Bien Biennale in order to get there. So first thing you would do is you go look and see who has represented Canada in the past. Or perhaps you want to have a show at, you know, um, a major museum in Toronto, or you want your work collected by major museums in North America, or even Europe. Then what you need to look at is who has, who's currently in those positions? What have they done? What is their background? If you look at more contemporary sort of people in terms of, um, if you look at like long hundred years ago, it's totally different because graduate school for the arts didn't really start becoming a thing until the sixties. So you gotta keep that in mind. So those that have come before you, um, you're gonna be looking for contemporaries to sort of aspire to or look to see where they are. A lot of times as artists, we have people whose work resonates with us. It's actually a really good idea to go and research who they are, what's their background, where did they go to school, what have they done, looking at the shows that they had or the things that they participated in between the time they were, you know, emerging to where they are now. That will give you a really good blueprint and a really good idea of the kinds of things you want to do. When you're deciding about grad school specifically, you're looking at issues of location, especially if you have commitments locally where you are, you're looking at issues of cost. You're looking at issues of being sort of a fish out of water. Um, and those are things that are, that are actually really tough. But what you need to consider is if you want to go to grad school, your reasoning, there's a couple different things that happen. Sometimes at the end, wherever you are, say you're stuck in your career, or let's say you're coming to the end of your bachelor's degree and you're like, oh, what do I do next? A lot of times having the idea that grad to go to grad school is actually comforting because it's another level of something that you're sort of familiar with. Sometimes it's the thought that I'm stagnating where I am. I need more feedback or I need, you know, a little bit, I need something else to push myself forward. And some people decide to go to grad school then. You have to make that decision for yourself, but let's talk about the value of that, okay? The fact of the matter is when you start looking at those there, and I'm going to tell you things that I've had people say to me, people I respect and people who are mentors. And I'm going to tell you things that I believe. Okay. And so you have to, I'm telling you that it, as it, it's an opinion. Um, and I need you to sort of, you know, take that for what it's worth when it comes to this. There are those that have said that, if you wish to be collected in the National Gallery or such, and you're a young emerging artist now, it's very hard to get shown in certain levels of institutions without having a graduate degree. The truth is, this is my opinion, I don't think that's necessarily true. What I believe to be true is that the number one reason to go to school, the number one reason is to build a network a network of people that you know, that you're close to, that can become colleagues, that can become mentors. Those are the people that are going to affect the rest of your time within your practice and within your life. I am still in contact with people that I went to undergraduate school with. I'm still in contact with people I went to graduate school with. 
it is through those people that I've received, I've gotten positions for work. Um, I've gotten opportunities for my artwork. Um, you know, I rely on those sorts of connections for my income and my practice. So keep that in mind because you need, that's a really, really big important piece that's gonna factor into some of the next decisions. If you keep that network alive and you keep that contact up, for instance, I have contacts with professors that I had um, in graduate school who, I, the only reason I got the jobs I did after graduating was literally my connections. Um, and I, it's that sad sack sort of reality of it's not what you know, it's who you know. And the truth is, is a lot of that does come into play. And one of the best ways to build that out is to go to grad school or to go to school at all. The other ways are participating in residencies and things like that. There are other solutions to that problem. So there are other options. I'm just giving you the school sort of version of it. So when you look at that and you make the decision, okay, yes, this is something I want to do. The next thing you have to look at is what degree do you want? And a lot of times people will decide that based on income prospects um, or they'll decide it on sort of like feasibility of um, let's say some of the best schools for what you would kind of want to go to school for are not local and you have commitments locally. Or let's say that, you know, you really do want to go to art school, but at the same time, the whole idea of doing that, what in the world are you going to do when you're done? Those are definite issues. The only thing I will say about it is commit. Whatever you decide to do, commit to it. If you're going to go to art school, commit to it. You can't do it sort of one foot in, one foot out because you are trying to build that network. Building that network means you have to spend time and energy with those people. And you can only really do that when you're fully in. So you have to make that decision. However, once you're in school, there's no reason why you can't do double majors. There's no reasons why you can't for instance, I actually worked with the anthropology and sociology departments at UC Irvine in my research for my practice. And work, I had two professors from those departments on my thesis committee. So it's not unusual to sort of, um, I want to say coagulate, uh, different sort of subjects. If you want a credential in that, in a different um, or in an additional, uh, discipline, then that's a that's something else. But there are programs out there that actually cater to that. Um, at one point, I know some that was looking into sociology and law, and you know, there's lots of different things that you can actually marry those two things together. Keep in mind, though, that if you're going to do that, and there's specific people teaching within those combined disciplines, you need to gel with them. You can't gel with some in one program and some of the other, and I will get to more of that in a second. So deciding the degree you want, being 100% in, whatever you decide, and it's scary. I, I won't even sugarcoat that, it absolutely is. When I decided personally to go to graduate school, I think I was literally saying it because everyone kept asking me what I was gonna do with an art degree. So I said, well, I don't know, I'm gonna go to grad school and I'm gonna teach because I found out with, with an MFA, I could teach college university level. I thought, okay, well, that's what I'll do. And thankfully, I was ignorant and didn't know enough that, you know, that's a hard, hard thing. Um, but it actually gave me a little bit of focus without too much noise of my, you know, inner voice saying, really, is that really what you're going to do? So that's, that's a hard thing is getting really solid with it. When you're looking at art or a creative discipline that you're looking to go to school for, you have to make a couple of decisions about the types of programs. And I'm going to go through this. So as I said, when you're looking for what to look for, once you've made the decision you want to go to school, you have to figure out what's your goal. So if you want to teach, then you need a terminal degree, which means a PhD or an MFA or some terminal degree within that field. If you want to have build that network, have a better resume for getting more uh, exhibitions and possibly building your career that way, then <clears throat> who you know matters quite a bit, as I said. But the next thing that always comes up for people is geography. So a lot of times, and remember, I went to school years ago when there were a lot of um, professors who 
sort of came up through the 60s and 70s. And there were a lot of things that were said, such as, you know, if one of the students got married, specifically if it was a woman, a female, um, professors would say, well, her career's over. Um, so those were things that were sort of problematic. Um, but, and so some of the things that I've been told or heard have that tint to them. And I've tried very hard to clear that out. But the biggest thing I will say to you is that commitment to doing it also includes being uncomfortable with your geography. And in doing so, the only way to build that network is to actually stay in that place, wherever it happens to be, for some time after you graduate to actually flex the network that you've built. So if you plan to go to the UK for, an, for a graduate degree, try or be prepared to spend at least a year after you graduate in that, in that place to flex that network <clears throat> because it's that network. And you know if you're showing in, in galleries outside and around the school, you're gonna wanna be in that space coming straight back or wherever home happens to be, it, it sort of cuts off that network and cuts off all of that you've built. It doesn't mean you can't build it elsewhere. It just means you just have a few more steps you have to do to get there. So those are some things to think about. And a lot of people have said to me, you know, like I have family here or I can't uh, go, I have to be around here. They, the, a lot of people will ask about, what about online degrees? Those things, they're all options. Everything's an option. You have to decide what's best for you. The best case scenario is an in-person intensive experience for two, three years because the, the amount of time you spend in a program varies. And also, you know, you have to keep in mind that you want to be able to be there and not be too distracted because you're only going to get this, I'm going to say two years once. And in some ways, I, I wish that I had waited to go to grad school, to grad school because I think my practice would have been better if I had waited. However, whatever you do, you make the decision and you commit. So you specialize, you figure out how that's gonna work. How do you actually look for a program or a school? There's a couple of ways. And I'm gonna actually share something with you. Specifically, this is art specific, um, but I am going to just share my screen. There is a website called collegeart.org and it's the College Art Association. And this is actually the guideline. And I will, I will show you the actual um, website in a second here. I'm just gonna, for some reason, my acrobat's being picky. Um, I'm just gonna show you, why is it gonna do that? Okay, well, I'm gonna do it online. So this is the College Art Association website. And they actually put out a lot of program standards and guidelines to help you sort through things specifically within the arts, uh, museum, arts administration, art history, um, and also if you become an academic. So one of the things that I use specifically for this is under their publications, they put out something called an MFA guide or an MA guide. And that guide helps people. So the graduate program directories, and there's a couple. So the graduate programs in art history and it covers art history, admin, curatorial museum studies, library sciences, and the graduate programs in the visual arts, studio art and design, art education, film, conservation, and so on. And so the last time they updated it was in 2017. What you need to know about this is basically all of these schools are, and I actually was on the receiving end as the school, we receive a, a, a survey or a form to fill out for the College Art Association in which we indicate information in certain categories. 
So this is all school sourced. So the school is the one who wrote the information about themselves in here. And the biggest reason I think this is useful, even if you're not looking at an MFA, and there's lots of information in here, is specifically what, how it breaks it down, because it will give you information about how to actually make decisions or ask what questions to ask or what information to find on websites that are specific to what you're looking for. So I'm just going to go back to here and I'm going to go to Studio Art and Design. Oh, that's nice and easy. I had one all done up and highlighted that's being a little goofy. So we're going to look at this first one. So this is Columbia, New York. Okay. Who doesn't want to go get a graduate education in New York? So the very first thing you need to look at is you can look at accreditation. So let's talk about the difference between um, schools that are public, private, for-profit, and private not-for-profit. There's differences. The public institutions will be like your um, state, what we call state or provincial schools. So like University of Alberta, University of Calgary, uh, University of Michigan, um, uh, State University of New York. And so you'll need to be aware of that. Then there's the private nonprofit. Now, private nonprofit would be your CalArts, your Art Center, your, um, I'm trying to think, there's, there's not, a, not any private not-for-profit that I can think of. Well, Emily Carr and OCAD, they, they would be categorized as a private nonprofit, even though they're still a public institution. Um, and it, when I say that, I mean in terms of how much their tuition is, how they're funded, and what their financial aid packages are. In the idea of the government, OCAD and Emily Carr are definitely, and same with NASCAD, are definitely public. But in terms of when we start looking at how that factors in when you look at a University of Alberta versus an OCAD, there's a difference. And I can talk about that. So you need to keep that in mind because when you're looking at schools, and I, I literally have answered about 10 of these questions in the last two months, people have asked me about CDI and they've asked me about VCAD, so the Vancouver College of Art and Design, that's now got an, a, a space here in Calgary. <clears throat> Whenever someone is asking you to pay $30,000, $25,000 for school, I want you to really take a moment and think about that. One what credential are they giving you? Are they giving you a bachelor or a master's degree? Or is it a certificate? Um, and what exactly are you getting for what you're paying for? Those are things that I really caution people to look into because there's a lot of information out there about those private for profit institutions and whether or not the credential is worth it. So that was the other piece that you have to keep in mind with what is it you ultimately want to do with your degree? So as you're looking through this, okay, I'm going to show you a few things that you can look for or when you're looking online or searching graduate schools, how to sort of figure that out. So one of the first things is the degrees award is a master's degree. It's an MFA. This is a private university nonprofit. This is Columbia, New York, okay? And accreditation. Accreditation in the US is different than accreditation in Canada, which is different than accreditation in the UK and Europe. However, there's always an umbrella accreditation body. And let me just be clear, VCAD and CDI are accredited by the government of Alberta to operate in Alberta. So I'm not saying they're not accredited. I'm just saying be very careful about what it is you're getting. For instance, now this information is from 2021. I have not looked for 2022, but Emily Carr, currently offers a master's, an MAA. It's not an MFA. The MAA that they offer is not a terminal degree. An MA, a master of arts, is not a terminal degree. So their graduate school will not allow you to teach college or university. It does not give you that credential. But, and so, and that's, it's hard to actually get that information. So you need to know what it is you're looking at because you need to know what your goal is. So, and you can have a broad goal, but at least know sort of what to look for. The credential is going to be a big thing. It's going to make a difference. It's going to make a difference for lots of different opportunities. And then there's going to be times it doesn't make a difference at all. 
it just, you want to choose something that's not going to pigeonhole you. So for instance, if I went to Emily Carr for a master's degree, the program is amazing. I don't, you know, that's the one thing I do know about it, the credential you, they give you. And it's because UBC um, fought the provincial government in BC from allowing Emily Carr to have an MFA because it would compete against their program. So there's politics involved. And so understanding the hunt will help you sort of, you know, know what's happening. And if someone has a question, I can't see the chat right now. So feel free to just pop, pipe in. Um, so when you're looking at this, the first thing that I think is important that you should look at is the concentrations. Okay, this one's particularly within screenwriting because I'm looking at, you know, the film program. But this first little blurb is something that's written by the college, which is much different than what's on their website. What's on their website is written by their marketing department. What's in here is written by the art or the, the department this would have been by the film program department, okay? The next thing you look at, and these are the things to ask for, you wanna know about the deadline. And what I suggest to people is actually make it a spreadsheet. And once you figure out a few schools that you want to actually apply to, putting down when their deadlines are, okay? So that you can keep track of your applications because it is a bit of a problem. The biggest thing you want to know, don't look at tuition at this point, okay? We're going to get to that. But what you want to know is how many students are enrolled. So in this year, and in 2017 was the last time this guide was put out. That's, you know, usually they did it every couple of years. They didn't do it because of COVID and they're just trying to make decisions, college artists issues with making decisions about putting out an up-to-date directory. This directory is also available. I know it's at the AU Arts Library. I don't know if it's available at UC. You can also order it online. You can also download the PDF. So when you look at this and you look at how many students are actually enrolled, that's going to come up later for when we're looking at how many actually get in and whether or not there's studios. I had friends that went to the Slade in London uh, for their MFA and realized that they didn't get a private studio, that it was a communal space that about 40 different artists shared. So there's certain pieces in this you kind of want to keep track of even though some of that may not even be important to you. The requirements are usually a bachelor's degree. When we look at issues with admissions and you're looking at whether or not there's graduate, like the GSAT, which are standardized tests, don't let that throw you off at this point. So then you're looking at class size, students. The biggest one is, okay, so there's 284 students there number of male graduates, female graduates, you can get all sorts of information. This is the list of the faculty on the side. And then down here, special programs, program opportunities, financial information, because I know that's what a lot of people want to talk about. All students is $28,000 and that's US. And that's per, you know, that's per semester, okay? Which is a little crazy, but what you really want to look at or what you want to ask, and they don't often advertise it on their website. So you often have to call and figure this out. Do they offer tuition aid and remission? Tuition remission is generally what they give you when you are a graduate teaching assistant. I went to graduate school in the US on a full ride scholarship, but it was dependent on me actually being a teaching assistant. So because I was a teaching assistant, I, my tuition was paid for. And I also got a monthly stipend for doing the work. So what ended up happening was my tuition was covered and that's what happens when you're looking at public institutions and private non-for-profit institutions whose faculty require graduate assistance. Um, so what ends up happening is it's the contracts and I can get into that later. But when you go to an institution that actually has their graduate students teaching and has opportunities for, your grad for the graduate students to teach, that is usually when your tuition gets covered. So that's what I, what I mean when I talk about don't worry about tuition at this point. Now, keep in mind, schools that don't have an undergraduate program don't tend to need teaching assistance because it's usually the first year undergraduate programs that are very large. Like, you know, you're in a lecture with 80 students. I've been in a lecture with 400 students. Those are the ones that generally need uh, teaching assistance. So when you're looking at a school that doesn't have that kind of undergraduate program, those opportunities for teaching and tuition remission aren't often there. 
So this is where you're looking at the difference between sizes of institutions and what they offer. Especially if you're looking at doing double degrees or degrees that have other discipline input into your research and what you're doing, you're gonna to wanna to have access to those departments and that faculty. So when you're looking at this, this is what you're looking for. Like I said, they don't often advertise. Every now and then you're gonna see that term somewhere, but that's what you should be looking for. Tuition aid and remission, either or. Tuition aid and or remission, because that has to do, and it should say teaching assistantship, or they should state. Now, the biggest thing is, is when you look down here, okay, a lot of times it'll actually tell you how many students received the assistantship. So one in particular that I, well, Savannah is a great example of something that's hard, but one in particular is, let's go to Boston. Okay. So they have 200, and don't worry about how many applications to how many people admitted. So they admitted 89 people, okay, but only 38 enrolled. So that's going to tell you something. So you can ask these questions. How many students, you know, were admitted? How many students enrolled? They'll have that information. Then when you go down, you're looking at um, the students. So number of students and residents. So there's 69. If it's a two-year program, you split that in half. So that generally means, you know, it's like 80. So it's about 40 students per 69, 70, 35. Sorry, bad math. Um, there's generally 35 students per year, okay? When you look at that, then you're going to look at resources, financial information. So how many assistantships did, do they have? And down here, they're gonna talk about this. When you see guaranteed loan, ignore that, that's a US thing. Um, you will see student loans for Canadian schools. Of course, that just means they process them, it doesn't mean they give them. So under assistantships, available to all students in all levels. So applications received, there are 30, there were only 20 awarded, okay? But then when, and the maximum period of support is two years, so the full, full year of the program, working assistantships are 22. All of these start to add up, okay? The hours of required work per week is four. What you get for this is tuition remission. So those are the pieces that you have to ask or look for specifically to help you understand how much it's gonna cost. So that's why I said, don't, don't assume schools are out of reach because of tuition. Figure this stuff out first before you make that decision, okay? And there's nothing wrong with applying somewhere, getting their offer letter and making a decision from there. So then back to sort of making a decision. One of the things when it comes to art, and this is very visual art specific, is like I said, you're, there's going to be artists who are currently working or showing who you resonate with, whose work you feel a connection to. Find out where they went to school because there's different types of work depending on parts of the country. I'm sure you could, if you thought about it, you would say, you know, there's a difference between, you know, New York art and California art, like LA art. There's a difference between UK art and US art. There's a difference between Toronto and Vancouver. There's a difference between Montreal and the rest of Canada. You need to figure out geographically where you fit. So let's say, you know, it's the 90s and you are an abstract painter, you know, and you want to go to a school that's known for you know, feminist artists. That's not exactly a great connection because the number one thing about getting into graduate school is this. They don't pick you based on whether you're good enough. That, you don't have to think about it that way. You need to think about it in terms of where you fit, who you, who you can, would connect with because ultimately it's the faculty who decide who the graduate students are that they enroll. You need to, and I know some of you may have heard this before, you need to identify the faculty at the school and who you would want sort of being your mentor as your advisor. 
And this is where this becomes helpful. And of course the web and looking at, you know, institution pages and program pages is the list of faculty. To give you an idea, go through, look at all of the faculty. What do they make? And don't just look for big names because the fact of the matter is the big name artists at institutions, they don't teach. A lot of times they get a lot of um, research time instead of teaching time. So you're gonna be looking for people that are actually teaching. So they might not be you know, a name that you really know well, but you might be drawn to the school because of a name that is actually teaching there. But then look at the other faculty there. You need to identify at least four who you think you would really enjoy working with. That would make a big difference in your application because your application is gonna go through two processes when you apply. The first is it goes to the graduate studies department, which identifies whether or not you have the prerequisites. Do you have an undergraduate degree? Have you taken any standardized tests that we required of you? Have you included a portfolio? Are all your documents there? If that's yes, that package is then sent to the department. The department makes the ultimate decision on whether or not you're admitted to the program. Every faculty will sit in a, they will review some, they used to sit in a room when it was slides, when it was, when it, once it became digital, sometimes they would do it as a group, sometimes they do it individually. And that changed the dynamic significantly. However, they're looking for people that they're interested in working with. That's the criteria. The faculty that are currently there are only admitting students that they are interested in working with, whether it's the concepts behind your work, whether it's materials, materiality, something. Something has to connect between the institution, the instructors and the person applying for them to actually decide to admit you. So if you're applying to a school that has, you know, everyone there, they only paint cats and you're a sculptor who is really interested in aardvarks, that's not necessarily gonna drive. Now you could make some connections animal wise, but you get what I'm saying. Like there has to be, you can't, you can't fit a square peg in a round hole type of thing. And that would be a waste of one of your applications, which of course have fees. You know, you have to pay an application fee, plus it's a ton of work. So look for where that's going to, so location, geography is the first one. Second, where do you fit, okay? By looking at who you're interested in, finding faculty you'd actually wanna work with, then go and look at the graduate student work. And oftentimes it's available online. So if you go and look at graduate student work, you're gonna see whether or not the work that's being made, it doesn't, none of it has to look like yours. It doesn't have to jive. It doesn't have to be the same sort of conceptually or materially. It literally just has to feel comfortable to you. The biggest thing about fit is with faculty work, whether it's ideas, um, you know, areas of interest or materials that they're working with that's going to be the big piece because they're going to choose you based on whether or not they want to work with you. And if there is no faculty on the committee that's deciding who gets in, that you have a connection with who would want to work with you, they're not going to offer you admission because they only admit students, two to three students per faculty member is generally the rule. So if there's only, you know, eight faculty, they're not going to admit more than 16 or, you know, 24. So you got to think about it that way as well. So once you, this is all about the choosing for you. You have to choose what works for you. You have to be, you know, comfortable staying there as long as you can to work that network. And then, you know, you figure out whether or not they're an institution that would avail you of aid because unless you're independently wealthy and have a whole bunch of money to go to graduate school, which is incredibly expensive, you're gonna be looking for opportunities to work because not only is the TA ship great for tuition remission, it's also the number one thing that's going to get you opportunities to do other things. And teaching is not the be all and end all. I happened to be lucky enough to actually get a teaching assistantship working with the gallery in, at UC Irvine. And so I managed all the exhibitions in the University Art Gallery. Doing that then is what got me my job after I graduated. So there's things other than teaching. I also worked with, um, it was the digital archivist, which that if you knew me, you would know that's not my jam. 
Um, but I was in charge of all the digital archiving of undergraduate um, images that they wanted to archive. And so I helped, you know, put information into that system. That was one of my jobs one semester. So there's lots of different opportunities and it's those opportunities that give you the experience. Anybody who's been in the job market recently knows, well, first of all, people are asking for 10 years of experience for someone who's just graduated, which is ridiculous. Um, on top of that, no one wants to give you experience so that you can grow. So you're gonna be looking to get that experience while you're in school. And on, in terms of that, you're looking to build out your resume. You're looking to, if, you know, if showing artwork is your thing, you're looking to have exhibitions. You're looking to, curatorial is your thing. You're looking to develop exhibitions. You know, all the things that you're interested in doing, you need to actually try to do some of those things in school for two reasons. One, you need to know whether or not that's what you want to do. What you think you want to do when you start doing it may not actually be the thing you want to do. You may realize, oh, wow, I actually really don't enjoy this. Or you could realize, you know, I actually really enjoy this piece of this. And you can sort of follow that thread along and that's how you sort of develop your career. Nobody knows what they wanna be necessarily when they grow up and those that do, I envy you. Um, but it's through doing and, and trying and talking and listening and seeing that you actually get to grow that thing. School is that playground in which to do that. That's why I said you've got two years. You only have two, maybe three years depending on the program. You have to use that time as much as you can. You want to squeeze every single drop of juice out of that because you're never going to get that opportunity again to be able to have that time to make mistakes, have that time to experiment, have that time to reach out and do things that you wouldn't necessarily do. And it's that stuff that's not gonna set you up for getting a job when you're done. There's no magic job at the end of, a, of a, any degree. There's, it's an expensive piece of paper. That's all you're, you're getting. You're getting a very expensive piece of paper and you get to decide whether or not that's worth it but you also get to decide what you get out of that experience. Just going and attending class, don't go to school then. That it's not a good investment. If you're just gonna go and attend class and do what you have to do to get the check marks, to get the piece of paper, you're, that's, it's just not, you're not utilizing it to the full extent you could. And you know, it's really about connecting those positions after just like the location piece, if you're going to travel, I know lots of people that would go to the UK or go to the US for school, they would come back to wherever home was and try to somehow take what they learned and make that work where they were. But they've lost the connection to their network. They've lost any knowledge of people knowing who they are, or what they did. There's, there's a disconnect between, you know, if they say, well, I showed it, you know, X space gallery, nobody knows what that is. Nobody knows, you know, what the context of that space is, what kind of work they show. And so you lose that where if you can build off of what you're able to do during school by staying in that location for as long as possible, that's when you can start taking pieces of your practice and your professionalism and the work that you do, whether it's like employment work or other work, and then you can start looking at bringing that other places with you. But just going to school, graduating, getting on a plane and coming home, or even in a car and going home, you lose that. So I really, really, um, one of the number one things I recommend is being committed to the geography, being committed to actually going and doing it. You can't be halfway in, halfway out. Being committed to the program and getting the most out of it as you can. When they ask you, hey, are there any volunteers to do X? Volunteer. It's those things that are going to give you the connections to people that you wouldn't have other. I got involved in student council and actually became really good friends with the president of the student council, who's a personal friend now, like this is a long time later. Um, who you know is actually one of the heads of a political party, and this isn't Canada. Um, and that, that connection actually has become very helpful for me, lots of instances, 
Um, and I don't mean like in a greasy way. I mean, like in a, you know, questions way. Hey, I have a question about this. So, you know, those sorts of things. I had a, someone I went to school with who ended up being the dean at Hunter in, in New York. Um, I had someone who ended up going, I worked with somebody who ended up going and doing a residency at MoMA. And I was able to um, help them with a curatorial project they were working on. There's lots of different opportunities, but this is what I mean about squeezing as much juice out of it as you can. If you're going to invest that time, invest it. If you're going to invest the money, invest it. Um, and those are the pieces because the last thing you want is to graduate with a really expensive piece of paper that is literally just a piece of paper that you could have gone to Staples and probably gotten. It's really important for employment opportunities, for being able to set up your life, that you utilize that opportunity as much, as much as you can. So once you commit to that and you learn about what to look for, you learn about how to evaluate it, that's when it gets a little easier to, well, it doesn't get easier, but you get more centered in, this is what I want, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what I need to look for. And by the way, you're gonna figure that out as you're doing it. You're not gonna necessarily have all that information from the get-go. Looking at programs is going to give you that information. You're gonna look at faculty and you're gonna be like, wow, I really thought I'd like the school. You won't. I'll tell you honestly, going from undergraduate to gradu graduate, and this is an experience that a lot of people have, but I'll tell you mine because it's my experience, so I feel okay sharing it versus sharing someone else's experience. I applied to six schools. I didn't realize at the time that my work, which was really centered in feminist theory, um, wouldn't exactly fly at male-dominated, white male-dominated institutions on the East Coast. And I mean in the US. I went to undergrad in Canada and I went to US um, for graduate school. But I was applying to places that I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. I think I was just looking at schools, looking at grad students, not really connecting faculty. And I applied to a school in California on a whim. And it was mostly at the recommendation of somebody who had come through, a visiting artist who had come through and did a studio visit with me. And they said, you should really look at these schools. And I ended up applying to one of them. And I only applied to it because it was due before the other due dates. And I applied to it because I wanted to use it as my guinea pig to get my application done. So I applied to it and I applied to a bunch and I applied to some in Canada, I applied to more in the US. And so I think the application deadline was January 15th and I got a phone call on February 12th with a full ride um, offer from UC Irvine. And I was not a California person. I thought California, that's crazy. That's like earthquakes and fires and why, who would want to live there? And I ended up going clearly. Um, the others, the ones on the East Coast of the US, it was one I was waitlisted. The other one, I think I got second round waitlist. And then um, the other one was in Montreal and I didn't apply to Toronto at all. And the, yeah, because it was just Montreal, I think in Canada. So ultimately I decided and I agreed to go to California before I even heard back from everybody. I think I finally had to get my agreement in by the end of March. I didn't know what I know now. And that's why I'm sharing it with you um, for what it's worth. And just to give you information about how to try to figure out some of these unknowables before you invest that time and energy in actually putting applications together. And also having the conversation about the commitment piece so that you can make a decision about whether or not this is the right time. Is this what you really want to do? Do you like every now and then, like I'll sit around and be like, maybe I should go to school for law, which is crazy, but we all have these sort of, you know, what if conversations with ourselves, but knowing that you're going to, you know, some, and there's lots of people that are able to go to a part-time program, make it work and do things or do online and, and make it work. But I'm telling you that, and there's ways to do that well. But what I'm saying is, is that if you want to get every single piece of the experience out of it, doing the in-person, doing, you know, looking at, thinking about geography in terms of your work and your practice versus what's convenient and not scary, not scary. I should have stayed in Ontario. That would have been, that's where I went to undergrad. That would have been not scary for me. Um, instead, I went really far away and it was totally scary. 
And it was hard because I didn't have enough money to go home. My mom got sick. There was lots of things going on. Now, if I wanted to go to school, I'm looking at issues with family and things like that. People have jobs. They have connections. People, even as simple as having a car payment. Having a car payment can keep you from going somewhere else because what are you going to do with your car? How are you going to pay it? How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to manage all those things while you're away? Those are the things that, that personally are going to affect you and affect your decisions. There's ways to make just about anything work. I'm talking about sort of like the ideal. Um, but number one, if you go into it knowing that network is the best thing you're going to come out of it with, then you can decide whether or not you're able to network within the parameters of what you are dealing with, if that makes sense. It's eight o'clock, so I figure we'll take a five minute break. And I don't know if Jill is around to talk about taking a break. Yep, I'm right here. Um, sure. So thank you very much, Marianne. Um, enlightening as always. Uh, so we will take a five minute break. So at about um, eight or nine minutes after, we will um, we will start the the Q and A uh, session, and in the meantime, um, like I said, there will be um, a feedback form added to the chat for you to fill out. And for those of you who who weren't uh, here when I started, um, the feedback that we get from you guys for uh, from our presentations are incredibly valuable because the, the feedback's about other things too. So please take the time to fill that out. Thanks very much. So we'll see it. Well, now let's say, let's say uh, eight minutes or sorry, 10 minutes after eight, we'll come back. Sounds good. And we'll go through what to do with your applications and how to actually get in when we come back. Mm -hmm.
Hello, Margo. Hello, Marianne. <laughs> hello, Bernard. I thought I would just say hello and show a face <laughs> for a bit. I'm really, really enjoying your presentation, Marianne. Thank you so much for doing this. I had oh, no, no idea. I didn't, I didn't ever go to school because I figured I couldn't afford it. Dope. <laughs> anyway. Lots of people are, most people oh, yeah. decide that they can't go to school because of money. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where I'm at. And to tell you the truth, some of the things that you've talked about tonight are things that somehow went right over my head before. Maybe I wasn't ready to hear them yet or something, but yeah. I'm starting to think about it again. I mean, of course, all through trying to get over COVID, I just went, no, I'm just not even going to think about it. But yeah, it's still knocking on my brain a little bit. That's good. Yeah. In terms you, of, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Maria. No, like in terms of that, it, it's tough because, you know, a lot of times, and I talk to a lot of people, and unless there's someone here tonight who is, you know, a young artist who's, you know, really doesn't have a lot of things that are holding them sort of in their space, you know, like a mortgage or family or connections or, you know, all of the things that, that happen in life, it's harder to then go away for school. And so you have to make decisions about, okay, what can I do? There are, yeah. options. there's options. And I talk to people about that. Mm -hmm. I, and I'll give this analogy. I think of it like a tree. Okay. And I think of it as your ultimate big dream is at the very top of the tree. When you look at a tree, a tree goes up a trunk and it has multiple branches, right? Yes. Lots of branches reach the top. You don't necessarily have to go straight up the middle of the tree all the way to the top. There's lots of juts out here and there that will get you to the same place in a different way. Mm. So let's say someone, you know, let's say someone ha has a house with a mortgage and a family, and it's not easy for them to figure out how to decouple from that to go to school. Let's say their dream was to go to, I don't know, Montreal or Toronto or wherever to go to school. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to commit to that for, you know, two to three years. You can do it locally, but know that there's going to be limitations. So then you have to squeeze the juice a little different, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's ways to do that. There are programs. And also keep in mind, like, all this is an example that I know very well. AU Arts, when they developed the MFA in craft, they weren't able to offer tuition. I don't know if they're doing it now, but they weren't able to offer tuition remission at that time because there weren't enough large craft um, courses that they would need that many TAs for. Mm -hmm. And also when you're just starting out, it's, it's a financial issue for the institution. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, the biggest thing people will say to me like, well, how do schools do that? Like how, how can they possibly pay your tuition you know, if you're a TA, well, the reason is, is, is contracts, it's unions. Okay. So I want you to keep that in mind. Um, unions, and I'm just read. I'm trying to read a thing here. Don't. Yeah, they do. They leave with an expensive piece of paper and there's, it's just a branch on a tree. It doesn't yeah. mean that, you know, that's it. You're done. You screwed up and you know, you, you shot your shot and you're done there's other ways to get to the top of the tree. Okay. So, and I can talk about sort of those strategies, but ultimately when you're looking at school and you're going to do it locally, you still have to figure out how to get your needs met. And I mean that like really have to be selfish in terms of how do I dedicate? So let's say you're working full time and you have a mortgage and a family. How do you actually do that and dedicate that time? It's going to be a full-time job for sure. It's going to be a lot of work for you to balance adding something that substantial in. And you have to make that commitment, that two feet in thing. But there are still ways to manage that, especially if you want to stay local. If you don't ever want to leave, and I'm just going to talk about this locality, let's say you never want to leave Southern Alberta. Well, that's fine. You have a couple programs. You've got the UFC, you've got U Lethbridge, you've got a couple different places you can go to school, okay? depending on the type of credential you're looking to get. But you can also <clears throat> still go to those schools. And let's say you're gonna, I know people that have done this, commute between Calgary and Lethbridge, which I, I, they're, 
I'm a little too nervous about commuting that far, but some people do it. Okay. And I actually know someone who did their, who did that with you, Lethbridge lived in Calgary. It's tough. And you have to be able to dedicate time. So what they did was they figured out what days of the week they could spend, you know, 16 hours there with the student, like with their colleagues, the faculty, with the faculty, with their fellow students, because it's never in class that you're making those really great deep connections. It's the, you know, late night sculpture studio sessions where it's mm -hmm. a bunch of you and somebody brings in a pizza or a case of beer. And, you know, those are like, it's that stuff. Or, you know, when you're working alongside a professor because you're their assistant and they're publishing, I actually did this, they're publishing a, new, a Scandinavian newsletter. Um, and, you know, I was helping them put their research into the newsletter and, you know, do all of those things and having to connect with the people that they were co-authoring with. Those connections that I was working with and doing, that was great. Now that was virtual. So that was a lot easier. But, you know, there's ways. It's that building the network. The network is going to be the most important thing because that's what you're going to get. The piece of paper is just secondary. It's the network that's going to actually get you the opportunities and the jobs that you want when you're done. Mm -hmm. And so, like I said, lots of ways to get to the top of the tree. Art school isn't necessarily the only way, mm -hmm. okay? It's a little bit easier because it's usually intensive and for a period of time, but there's ways to do it afterward as well. So no, when you're looking at programs, look for those tuition remission pieces. Keep in mind, what I said about that is because of unions and contracts, faculty unions, have sort of regulations about how people any union contract any union environment if you're familiar with unions at all there's usually regulations about people that work hours and aren't paid faculty salaries okay so whenever you unionize environment the union protects each other to make sure that work standards and pay are standardized so that a corporation or an institution couldn't hire someone at a lower rate to do something that they should be paying at a certain level because that undermines salaries of people that are currently working. Does that make sense? So the reason why they do the tuition remission is because they can't afford, universities can't afford to pay TAs faculty wages and they don't want to give them faculty privileges. So in order to satisfy the unions, the university provides a waiver on tuition and pays the teaching assistant a small sum. Okay, I think in 2004, I was making oh, about $800 a course per bi monthly period. So, you know, I, I think at the when I first started, this was like 2004, I think I was making because I had three at one point or two and a half, I was doing about, I was taking home net about $1,900 US a month. Mm. And my tuition was paid for. And I was able to live on $1,900 a month, you know, as a student then. Mm. It was tough, don't get me wrong, but there were ways to do it. I also had some student loans to kind of back me up on that. So those are the things. Now, those amounts are much larger now. Okay, and also there's opportunities for stipends. So, so I would get paid. I remember in my second year, I, I it wasn't even an award, it was a stipend. I received an extra $600 a month just because I was a second year graduate student. So, you know, and that's the other thing. I remember a, a somebody telling me when I was applying and worried about the money, remember, you always get more money in the second year than you do in the first. And nine times out of 10, that's true. But the reason that's true because that was actually kind of not true. The reason that's true is usually you've made connections with faculty and they actually ask you to do their assistantships with them. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to cobble together more and more of that. When I graduated, I was actually working as an artist assistant in LA um, for quite a, for about a year and a half after I graduated. And that was a second job I had in addition to a few others. And the other question people will often ask is, as international students, you know, the tuition is so much more. There's issues with that, especially if you're looking to go abroad. 
there are ways around that. There's visa considerations, and I'm happy to talk offline about that with people if that is their situation that they're looking at. In Canada, you're not going to see as much tuition remission, but it's there. The biggest thing is to find out how many students do they admit, how many students get TA ships, and do they offer tuition remission? Those are the questions mm -hmm. right off the bat. Okay. Once you've sort of identified the schools that you have some sort of connection to. If you're actually thinking about applying, <clears throat> and if you have questions, you can feel free to ask or throw them in the chat. When you're looking at applying, I'm going to tell you how it used to go. Okay. So that because I think the cutthroatness of how it used to go is still relevant to how it is now. Okay. In the past, when they would review as a group, and keep in mind, current graduate students get a vote. They get a vote on who gets admitted. Okay. It's a usual, it's weighed as a half vote to a faculty member. But what happens is they sit in a room and they view, and it's usually, you know, digitally projected onto a screen and they go through. And if people are interested in what they're, they don't even read the file. They're only looking at the work. And if they're interested, and I'm, this, is ex this is how it went, and it's horrific and I apologize. Group of people sitting there, images come up, and if people are interested, they don't say anything. And if people are uninterested, someone says one, and then keep showing the next image, someone says two. If they hit three, they would st stop looking at the portfolio altogether. They oh. wouldn't look at the whole thing. Wow. Okay. And it was filed. And here's why. When you see in, in the, the directory, it'll say how many applications they received and how many they admitted. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, let's say there's 300 applications, which each have three recommendation letters, uh, you know, 15 to 20 images, uh, a CV, you know, a transcript. Think of all the things in the file. If you've got to go through 15, 20 images of 300 people, to decide to let in 20, it gets pretty monotonous after a while. Mm -hmm. And it gets pretty fast and pretty gross. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's almost, it's almost like Tinder. <laughs> it's art Tinder in some ways, you know, swipe white, swipe left. And so because of that, there are strategies to this. Okay. When you're building your application, and we'll talk about recommendation letters, but when you're building an application when it comes to a portfolio, and this is for anything. So if you think about it, residencies, uh, opportunities for any calls, things like that, this, you always got to sit in the other person. Don't think about it from your perspective, think about it from theirs. So if you're applying to something, what is it that they want? Okay. So what's their goal? If you can figure out what their goal is, you can try to align yourself to meet their goal and thereby go to the top of the list. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's a, well, it's as simple as this. Let's say there's a residency and they're looking for plein air artists and you don't do plein air work. Well, you're not gonna get in, okay? It's as simple as looking at the goal. And it could also be looking at the faculty. If all the faculty are a bunch of, I wanna cut like aliens. I wanna do something that's not real life just to make it a little, so it's not offensive. Let's say, you know, it's aliens. All the faculty are aliens and they're all, they're all Martians. They're all from Mars and they're okay with people from Venus and Mercury, but you know, really they just like the color blue. And all you do is moon work that's red. Mm. They're, they're, you're gonna get shoved to the back, you know? But the trick with the application piece is when people have to look at a lot of, images to decide so even 50 if i told you you had to look at 50 people's portfolios and they had 20 images each it's days it's like so much time and you're not even looking at the rest of the you're not reading artist statements you're not reading anything you're literally just looking at work so think about it from that that way they're just looking at work and nine times out of 10, they're just looking at work first. Everywhere I have been, they have never cracked the file until they looked at the work. They always weeded out the applicant. Okay. And this is curatorial. Like, I mean this in every place I've ever been. 
you always did the work first. So even as a curator, we looked at work first, then we looked at statement. We looked at work first, then we looked at recommendation letters. We looked at work first. I don't care what your GPA is, as long as you met the threshold to get from the graduate department over to the art department, that's all. You just have to meet the criteria, then they send the package over. Because I'm looking at 350 applications of 20 images each, your strategy is you put your best work first. Do not do it chronologically. Every single person that did it chronologically, because think about it, oftentimes your best work is at the end. Well, if they only got to five images before it got one, two, three, and you're out, they didn't even see what you're currently doing. Do not put in your work chronologically in an application unless it specifically states that. That's the other thing is make sure you read the directions and what it states. But also keep in mind reality of a bunch of people going through a portfolio. Okay. You put your best work first. First three images, your best work. The last few images, your best work. So you split it. Okay. Because you want to get a good impression. So they keep looking and you want to leave them with a lasting impression so that you, they re, you remain on their mind. You hide the not great in the middle, okay? But this is also where give them the information they need. They don't know nothing about you. They haven't even, they might know your name. You might be a number. They might not have any idea who you are whatsoever besides a number and some images because often that's what they do. So with that in mind, you need to find someone in your world who is not, I used my mom. My mom was great for this and other people have other people, whether it's a friend or whatever, someone who's not in the art world, someone who, you know, can stand to look at it, um, who, you know, will give you an honest opinion. Because what I found was a lot of times when you'd go through applications, people would put in work and you would see an image, but you had no context for it. They're not even reading the title. They're not looking at what the material is. They're not looking at dimensions. So you need to provide as much visual information as you can. This is where your images become so important. So if you do sculptural work and you don't have, not an installation image, but like an image of it, like don't just do the white background where it has nothing around it to give it, unless you're trying to hide the scale. Because this is this is where you also get creative with your imagery, okay? But you know you want to have like for. I used to make things. I used to make installations. I actually started producing video documentation of my installations of walkthroughs because it it was the immersiveness of being in the space that became really important for it to read to people when they were looking at an image of it. So I used video documentation for that, but I also needed to have images that also provided as much of that immersive sort of experience as possible. So those are things that are really important. Okay, so keep that in mind. Keep that in mind for details. Do not be afraid to give detail images. Because let's say you're a painter, but you know, the brushstroke or details or close ups or something becomes really important you need to make sure that that like if it's you would know whether it's important but this is where having someone to bounce that off of becomes really important as well because they can look at it and be like well, i don't know what that is what it like what is that or if you they look at it and then you tell them about it and they're like well i thought wow that's really interesting i didn't know that from looking at the image you need to put more information in that image somehow or you need to provide something okay so don't be afraid to provide so when you look at 20 sizes the other thing people are like oh my god i don't have enough work Think about it this way. You're going to want at least five solid works that you're documenting. Okay. Really, ideally, you're not going to want, you don't want 20 distinct pieces. You do not want to do that. But unless somehow your work is really easy to read in an image, you want to provide them as much visual information as possible to keep them engaged. Okay. If you think about it from their experience, of looking at it, it helps you decide how to present it in a better light. And like I said, this goes for everything you have to provide images for, whether it's a residency, a grant, any of those things. Okay. 
And then also another thing that comes up is, does it have to be recent work? No, but it can't be 20 year old. Like it has to have some sort of relevancy, okay? But there's nothing wrong with revisiting a piece that you did 20 years ago that you're very proud of. Let's say you revisit it and you alter it in some way or you do something with it. That's not necessarily a 20 year old piece anymore, if that makes sense. So, and I know I'm kind of splitting some hairs here, but like I'm, what I'm saying is, there's lots of ways to get to your end goal. You have to make the decisions about the best way to do that and definitely have some people in your life that you can show things to and get their feedback on. Do you want to know the applications that I did the best on in everything, in shows and everything? Were applications that I gave them more information than I thought I should. I gave them more detail images. I gave them more sort of, because I remember applying to things and providing video and someone said, well, don't give slides of that as well. Well, what I come to find, and when I mean slides, I mean images. What I come to find out is if they see your images and they're not interested in you, they will never open up any moving image or sound image. Okay. Whatever platform they're looking at, like if, of course, if it's film, they're gonna want to have to look at the film but make sure that you, whatever platform they're looking at, if you know that they're gonna be looking at the, the still images first, make sure you provide still images of any moving or, you know what I mean? Like try to provide as much information as possible because you want to get through that horrificness of the one, two, three, you're out, okay? You need to keep them engaged long enough. Best work at the front, some good pieces at the end does not need to be chronological. I always sandwiched it, especially on an application of 15 to 20. I always did three to five, three minimum, three to five great at the front. Then I did a couple like, you know, details and stuff. Then in the middle, I did something that was like pretty good. And then, you know, some more information. And then the end ones, I did about three to five of another good set, okay? So if you have 20 images, you want to have no, you probably want 10 distinct pieces, but that's really up to you, depending on the detail and stuff. The other thing is you want to make sure that your work doesn't have to be the same, doesn't have to be the same material or anything like that. Conceptually, there has to be some sort of thread that runs through it that you can speak about or some sort of something that ties it together, okay? And it doesn't have to, and I mean this very, um, it does not, have, what I'm saying isn't distinct. What I'm saying is ties together, like let's say you're interested in flowers. All your images don't have to be flowers. Some of them can be of vases, okay? If that makes it, like it can be tangential, but make sure that whatever is going on is all related to X and it can be a very large umbrella idea. Let's say you're interested in materiality of paint then all of your stuff is gonna to have to have something to do with material of paint. Maybe it's about the smoothness, maybe it's about brushstroke, maybe it's about, you know, like there's lots of different ways to get there, but you're gonna to wanna to be able to show that at least through most of your images, okay? To sort of back up. Um, but that's, that's a big piece that I think a lot of people don't know going in about applying to things is thinking about it from their point of view. It is not about good enough. It is so not about that. If you've gotten to this point, you're already good enough. I'm, I'm literally just going to like lay that out right now. Even, even when I was looking at art or artists that would blind apply as for exhibitions, the work was always good enough. It just wasn't good for where we were. So it was about context. If you're applying to a gallery or school or whatever, and the work they show, if all they show is cats and you're, you know, putting in aliens, they're not going to show your work. It's about context of who you're applying to. The work was all good. It was all decent. It just didn't work with what we did. And that's with schools as well. You can't apply to a feminist school being like, you know, sort of a sterile materialist, um, does, if that makes sense. So those things you have to keep in mind. That's why it's important to look at where you're gonna be. Then, like I said, it's the commitment to the place, commitment to the network, spending the time and doing the work and getting as immersed in it as possible 
so that when you come out, you can actually apply not what you know, because you're learning, but you're more learning about how to operate within the system than you are learning about. You're learning about art world. You're learning about, you know, sort of the art community. You're learning about the community in which you are at that point, geographically, in a geographer's geogra geographic sense. You're learning about, you know, how your work operates in different places. And then you have to translate that to something that's going to pay your, your bills. And like I said, it's about connecting the pieces of what you did in school to what you want to do or what you can do or what you're interested in doing later. And it's that experience that you get there that's really important. And I'm just going to show you something else before I ask, I ask if there's any questions is when you're applying or, you know, there's some things, and this is a, especially if you're not sure about the kind of experiences you want to have, or you don't know how to get as much out of the, you know, um, experience. One of the things that I think is really good, a lot of people get hung up on artist statements and CVs and such, and there's lots of great resources out there. And I'm actually, I'll put, I have a package that I'll send out to everybody. Um, after the talk by tomorrow morning um, that I'll share some of this information with you so that you can you can view it it'll include the PDF of the directory but the other thing I, I want to share with you is actually in on the college artist issue I use this specifically because it's it's actually pretty um, I've never seen a school or a place deviate from the general ideas that are centered here so this is the College Art Association website again, okay? And this was under the standards and guidelines. So the, the art program is underneath other publications under publications, standards and guidelines, and this is just a treasure trove of information. This has lots of information about, this is generally for faculty in universities and colleges that offer art programs. And it helps support people who are pursuing to become that, people who are pursuing education within it, people who are currently there now, but there's also a few other things. So right off the top, this is this, this will not, this is not fun reading. And I don't know if you'd be interested in this, but if you're interested in how different programs get accredited or what makes a good program, this is essentially the academic guidelines for what a good curatorial studies program should include, um, including contact hours with faculty, um, different sort of class things. So that's, and that sort of centers around accreditation, which you don't have to care about, but this will tell you, if you're looking at a program and you're not sure whether or not it's a good one, you can review this and it will tell you whether or not, it'll tell you the criteria that makes a good program versus a not great program. But the biggest thing is down here like guidelines for interviews, you know, tools for visual artists. This is what I like. So this is the artist resume and the CV. The artist resume is essentially is a short form CV and that you would use to accompany um, any, like for instance, even exhibition proposals, you would use an artist resume. A CV is more of a larger document that's going to collect all of your professional experience um, in one document. I generally tell people to create a master that, that they then pull information out of into sort of a short. But the reason why I bring this up, and there's lots of like information in here that is really useful. Guidelines for presenting works in digital format. That's a great piece too. And there's lots more information down here, but I'm gonna go here because I want to show you why. So keeping in mind that this is generally for people, this, the audience for this document is people who are seeking employment within an academic institution. However, the information in here is very pertinent to what it is you are doing as an artist or as a creative person. So the biggest thing, and it talks about sort of like the background of a CV versus an artist resume, and, you know, talks about padding your CV and why you shouldn't. But the biggest thing is, okay, going through here, it points out areas 
of things that you might want to document that you did that you wouldn't necessarily have thought of. So, and it gives a little bit of a sample, talks about name, education, and there is some information here you got to take with a grain of salt. This I use very much as a, especially with artists who are like trying to build their career, this is a great checklist of things you should do or get experience in if you want to keep growing your practice and your profession. So for instance, okay, so education, fine, whatever that may be, teaching experience, but think of it as professional experience. If you look at specifically, they go through some of, some of the pieces, you know, if you had an opportunity to teach as a graduate student, or you had an opportunity to be a guest lecturer, there's ways in which you can actually, and this is the actual standard of how you list those things out, awards, grants, and fellowships exhibition record. This is where it gets kind of interesting. I think this is very helpful because this is the same way you document things that you would do in your artist resume. Solo, two-person, solo, talks about different things. There's different comments, lots of information about whether or not it should be have a solo or if you've had enough solo exhibitions to actually list that. Collaborative project, group, sort of the general consensus of how you list those things, what should be listed, what shouldn't. Like there's a there's an unspoken, I think it's not spoken, an unspoken rule that if you're the curator, you shouldn't also show. If you did, generally the rule is you choose. You can't put it both down on your resume. You can't be the curator and an artist in the exhibition because that means you chose you. And when you read through this, you'll kind of understand that because the whole idea about being in a curated exhibition or juried exhibition is because you were deemed to fit into a group where others weren't. Not necessarily about hierarchy, but basically saying you were chosen. So you can't be the chooser and the choosy. So you got to pick one or the other. You either list yourself as the curator or you list yourself as an artist, never both. Selected group ex exhibitions, commissions, bibliography. This would be thing where people published about you and your artwork. Then there's something later on that's going to talk about if you wrote anything. So this is a good idea to like kind of get some general buckets of different kinds of experiences you'd like to have, because I don't know, you know, you make work now, maybe you actually want to write about it. Maybe you want to, you know, do something else. And this is about, this is the whole piece of finding the employment opportunities after is doing the things you enjoy doing, figuring out what those are, having the time within school to actually experiment with those things, or even, you know, where you are now, maybe you can experiment with those things now. But it's a good idea. Here's some thing. Here's some ideas of things you could do to get some experience with that are still within the arts that can actually lead to some employment opportunities later. So this is just a really great document. There's lots more that's really helpful on on this web page, and and there's lots of things. Of course, jobs opportunities programs, lots of things in here. So that would help you put together whatever information you would need for an application or for whatever you're happy to happen to be looking to do. So I wanna open it up to any questions or if anyone has anything specific they wanted me to touch on or any general comments, please let me know where you can put them in the chat. Yes, please. Um, we, uh, why don't you uh, turn on your cameras and, uh, and your mics and uh, if you, if you wanna, we could engage in a discussion for the next uh, 15 minutes or so, if you if you like, if anybody has any questions or comments. Or if anyone yeah. wants any information about specific programs or practice or anything. Yeah. Please don't be shy. Marianne is very open to whatever. I like um, in the standards and guidelines, the tools for artists looking at the CV. I've, I've been a working visual artist for 25 years and my CD is sort of similar, but there are some things that I'm like, oh yeah, this is what I should be doing. And I think I'm kind of feeling like I might be too old to go to school at this point. I'm in my fifties. I My energy is definitely different than it used to be and et cetera, right? But I'm thinking that this makes a lot of sense for applying for shows because I do like these installation things where it's a more formal application for shows besides the kind of commercial stuff, right? Yep. And so that's a really, really good thing to find in there. That that website, I know I'm gonna be looking at that and uh, and I and like checking out all the different things. There's so many things in there that are so useful. 
Um, there are also, and I know yeah. the bookstore at AU Arts used to carry it. There's also an, an old, I have a copy somewhere. It was put out by Carfac, Ontario or Carfac. And it was a guide for visual wow. guide for artists. And it's got, a, it had a white cover. I have it. I'm ha I should, I should totally digitize that for myself. So I don't lose it or something doesn't happen to it. And it had information about how to take photographs of sculpture, how to hang work, how to like what the general standard is in terms of eye level, how to negotiate that. Like it was a Bible of information. And it's funny because you don't see a lot of that out there anymore. So when I came across, you know, CAA, the College Art Association, that I go back to it regularly for stuff. And they're constantly updating things. They have a conference every year. You want to talk about networking? They have a conference every year, which mm -hmm. I used to attend all the time. Fantastic fun but also crazy good information. And a lot of times if you sign up for conference information, you can get copies of presentations, which are really helpful as well, because you know maybe you're not able to travel to New York if they're having a New York that year, or Boston or Dallas or wherever it happens to be, but really great information at the conference about sort of, and it's about standards. It's generally about standards of acceptable stuff within, you know, like, what do we do about nudity or what do we do about, you know, lots of different issues. It's interesting. Yeah, cool. So even if you are not enrolled in a secondary institution, you can sign up for a conference. Oh or gosh. Yeah. The college art association uh -huh. is for anybody. It just so happens to cater to mm -hmm. academic programs, institutions, teachers, graduate students, students, people who kind of want to be students, but it's also just generally about art. Oh, very you know? cool. Yeah, so like there's lots of, there's gonna be lots of stuff. I saw Orlan, I don't know, okay, that ages me, 90s body art person, she's French and she used to body, she had plastic surgery to body morph herself, that was her practice. And I actually oh, saw her in person in New York at the CAA conference, which I thought was crazy. So yeah, like there's lots of, but the other thing that people go to the conferences for, not that you're necessarily going to go, is really for the parties. And a lot of times the major galleries will throw sort of like parties and receptions and that's a networking opportunity. But keep in mind, it's geography limited. So, you know, if you're never going to go back and try to practice in New York, building your, you know, you want to build a network, right? Where it is you are. Yeah, cool. Cool, cool. Wow. Anybody else? Um, so I'm looking at um, applying to U of C because geography, I am yeah. bound to this location um, oh. with the mortgage and the dog and the mom. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I just wondering if you had any comments on that. And I was contemplating doing a double master's and I was just wondering if you had any advice about how to approach something like that. So oh man okay so I'm going to make some generalizations okay and they're not I I'm I don't think they're politically incorrect and I apologize if they are um but basically so art faculty and artists artists uh, this is a big ugly generalization tend to be very um not self-involved but very much sort of they like themselves a lot like some people do right and if you're applying to, and I don't mean this for UFC specifically, but if you're applying to a program, an art program, an MFA, and you tell them in your application, in your package, like in your, you know, a lot of times you have to write something called a statement of purpose, a statement of purpose, an artist statement, and a statement of intent, those are different things. That's the other thing you should know, okay? A statement of purpose is, what is it, what is it you're going to do here? A statement of intent is what do you plan on doing while you're here? And an artist statement is a statement about your work and practice. Okay, that, that's a real quick, dirty sort of uh, generalization about it. If you tell art faculty who, like I said, they pick the students that they want to advise. They're not gonna pick students that they don't see a connection with or who they don't think will look up to them, okay? putting it that way. So if like, they're not going to pick somebody who, whose opinions about stuff are going to be diametrically opposed. Okay. 
because generally they like to have people around them who like them and who like the things they like. That's like all people. <laughs> okay, but generally, what do you think about faculty? If you tell them you're going to do a double, they're going to, they're, there's going to be someone who is going to assume that you're not fully committed, so they're not going to waste the time. So there are ways to do it, is what I'm basically saying. A, I wouldn't announce it unless there's already a program that has those two things combined already. You can talk about if you're applying, like, let's say you're going to apply to an MA in sociology. And is it an MFA and an MFA? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, you definitely don't wanna alert the MFA folks that, no, no. And I know some of those people, so no, don't do that. Um, but what I might do is in your artist statement or your letter or your statement of intent or whatever it is they ask for, talk about your interest in furthering your creative research in issues of, I don't know, pick something in sociology. Uh, human memory in if it, whatever it happens to be, okay? And then you can, and say, you know, I might be in, in you know, allude to the idea of might be interested in working with faculty from, you know, or, or getting input. But generally keep in mind who your audience is always. Who is your audience for what it is they're looking at, okay? If your audience is the MFA faculty, they want you 110% or they don't want to waste their time, right? Because that's the thing with graduate students is the faculty spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with them, a lot. And so this is to their point. They don't want to invest that amount of, oh, and that's the other thing. They don't want to invest that amount of time. There used to be, there used to be if, if gra prospective graduate students said in their applications that they wanted to teach, they would automatically go in the bin. I can talk about what they talked about in terms of their psychology behind that, but essentially it was like, well, why am I wasting time if they don't even want to be an artist? It, it's weird. So consider your audience whenever you're applying, okay? The sociology department, it's the same thing. You know, I, I've worked with enough faculty to know, like, how many PhD people have you met that aren't fully engrossed in what they do? Well, they are because that's, you know, like that is all they are. That's who they are. They are their subject matter, like what it is they're interested in, their research, just like artists are. So, you know, you have to think about how to do that. There's no, nothing that stops you from entering a program and taking courses because there's going to be courses you have to take outside of the field anyways, taking courses alongside. So as soon as you're a student, it's easy to get into a lot of sort of like the front end courses. You can also go talk to the graduate advisor in let's say you want to go into the MFA and, and pursue some of the MA in sociology, go talk to the graduate advisor, tell them what your interests are, tell them that they will give you, you have to get permission to be entered into some of those classes. You can absolutely do that. The registrar's office are the ones you speak to about combining the courses to create your, like to make sure both degrees are satisfied, okay? The faculty in those programs are not the ones to speak to about that. Does that make sense? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Cause that's definitely not something I would have thought about going in. But so can I you really say advice? Yeah. It's really just who's your audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Sorry, I was just writing something down. Okay, um, anything else? No, nope. there must be something. Oh, I know. I have a. I have a question. The um, the 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 college arts uh, site that we were looking at. That I I might have missed something, but it looks like a lot of that info is just U.S. based. Is are there also Canadian? Um, there schools? is. So the Canadian schools are members of the College Art Association, okay. but like a lot of US centric things, mm -hmm. they think that only the US exists. Um, right. <laughs> I, you understand what I mean. And so a lot of it is, is so you have to keep that in mind. Most of the, most of the uh, institutions are members of the CAA that are in Canada. Yeah. Just like there's another one, if you're looking at accreditation, there's something called NASCAD. So it's NS, 
CAD, the okay. national, no, NAS, the National Association of Schools, uh, Schools and Colleges of Art and Design. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's, it's a general umbrella organization that most good schools are members of. But mm -hmm. when you get into US schools, and I'm happy to take emails from people if you have questions about anything specific, um, because it's really easy to go down the wrong path when it comes to schools and, and programs. I, I, I know I shouldn't, but it's, it's like when you think about DeVry and what happened with DeVry, and I didn't realize how big of a deal that was in Alberta um, when DeVry came here and a lot of people went to school, uh, DeVry, which the people teaching were absolutely, they, they knew what they were doing but the institution got a reputation and then that became an issue for graduates. And of course there was the class action lawsuit in the US with you know, US DeVry. So there's lots of pieces there. But what I'm saying is when you're looking at like the CDIs, the Robertsons, the VCADs, know what you're getting. It's totally great if that's what works for you, but know what you're getting. If you're looking to do something that's not two years that you don't need the fancy piece of paper for, look at other opportunities, residencies. Um, residencies are huge and such a great way to network. The other one is like SATE. SATE has some amazing programs and like some of the other colleges and, and um, what are they, polytechnics have sort of shorter, more intensive, really great informative certificate programs and small diploma programs. Those are all worth it. Absolutely 100% but know what it is you're getting when you make that decision. I just have a really, I literally just talked to someone last week who emailed us out of the blue, who was looking at a $35,000 a year bill to go to one of these smaller privates for a non-degree. And I, I asked just like, what are you looking to get? And what they were looking to get and what they were going to get were not meeting at all. And so I just, I just caution them to look for certain things because that's scary to me. That's where I think, oof, you know, that's scary. So yeah, just know what it is you're, you're looking to do. Keep in mind who your audience is. Remember that they don't have a lot of information when they're looking at your stuff. You can always make it work. It's a tree. You'll get there one way or another. Just choose a branch. <laughs> I like that analogy. That's awesome. Wow. Well, um, we're coming up to 9 p.m. So um, I think um, I think we can call it a night. Um, thank you. Thank you so much once again for your um, your insights and your your experience and your expertise. And um, yeah, and thank all of you for being here tonight. And um, I hope this information will help you move forward with your decisions about where you want to go next. So, um, yeah. Anyway. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Feel free to reach out. Okay. Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Take care. You too. Thank you, Marianne. That was fantastic. Thank you. No problem. Mm -hmm. Can I ask one question? Of course. I have a friend, um, she's actually in, in the US and I know this is being recorded. Could I share this with her or is that, I'm not sure what the kind of- uh, Will be. Like, you, is that weird? You registered and attended. You registered and attended. You will be sent a link to the recording. Yeah. My involve, our involvement in that after that is none. We send you the link to the recording. Okay, I just wanted to be sure that, that that was like an okay thing to do. I'm not sure what the parameters are around stuff like that always. So I really appreciate you asking. Okay, yeah, because I think she can find it useful. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially... I don't think she wants to go to school, but she's been applying for exhibition and asking me to look at her mm -hmm. work and stuff. And I'm thinking that a lot of what you're talking to applies to the kinds of things that might be really good for her to know. So, and and particularly the College Art Association website, she might really appreciate, you know, that link, which I could just send her that, but you gave a lot more than just <laughs> what's on that website. So that I, that's just 
when yeah. it comes to exhibitions, okay. I'll say this, keep in mind, so um, keep in mind, so there's something called blind applications. That's when mm -hmm. as an institution, or, it depends on where you're applying for shows. If it's a commercial gallery, there's a different way to do that than if it's a public yeah. institution. And if it's a blind application, that means there's been no call. You're literally just stuffing Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember this is like old school, but you're stuffing like big manila envelopes with information and sending it off. Don't mm -hmm. like it. Yes. Okay. You can get some success there, but it's like the, the numbers on that are crazy. Um, honestly, the biggest thing is yeah. try to get, uh, try to get a connection, go to one of their openings, talk to the, whoever's like the curator, talk to somebody, remember who your audience is. Remember they're interested. Everyone's always interested in talking about themselves, right? You got to create that that network, that connection, because then when your package comes across the desk out of 50 or 300, they're more likely to mm -hmm. open yours because they recognize your name than they would as someone that's just like a Joe Schmo to them. OK, yeah. so that's that's the biggest thing. I used to have my intern go through my blind packages when I was a curator. Um, and she had three piles. I had her do absolutely not, maybe, yeah, have a look. And I would only look at the, yeah, have a look. Unless mm -hmm. I knew who it was. And I would pull that package out before I hand them to her. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's all about who you know. <laughs> but it's about volume. But if you, instead yeah. of, like, is that always seems schmarmy and horrible to me? Because I'm an introvert and I hate schmoozing. So mm -hmm. like, I hate it. So my network happens to be small, but very deep, if that makes sense. So mm -hmm. what I tend to do is you'd be surprised. Like people will, like, if you just, it's, it's when they don't know you from Adam, you know what I mean? Where if you've gone to a show, you've met them, you said, hi, nice to meet you. And you talk about the show. You don't go in talking about yourself. You talk about them because that's what everyone loves, you know, and you have a conversation maybe follow it up, whatever. But it's that little bit that will get the package looked at. It's about volume. So if they're getting 50 to 300 packages every week or two weeks, you're a needle in the haystack. You need them to see the glint of the sun off the needle. And the glint of the sun is something. It's an introduction. It's a, you know, they saw it something, right? And you just got to figure out how to get the glint off the needle to be able to pull out of the haystack. Nice analogy. Yeah. Cool. So helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Things I wish I knew when I was younger. <laughs> yeah, I know. Me too. Me too. At least you turned your camera on. Did you have another question? No? Okay. All right. Nope, just putting a face out there. <laughs> okay, yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, well, I'll send out some information um, with a copy of the link for you guys probably tomorrow. And um, yeah, like honestly, because later on some point, even three months down the road, you're like, oh, hey, I wonder about, shoot me an email, no problem. Thank okay? you, thank no you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. No worries, have a great night. Okay. You too. So nice to you Marianne all. and Karen, can you stick around for a couple minutes? Sure can. Okay. Sure can. Night, Verna. Good to see you. Good night, Margo. Good night, Marianne. And Good night. Bye bye. Um, I just thought we would we would have one of these little five minute talks. I mm. think I think tonight went really well. Um, so interesting, Marianne. I'm so sorry I was late. Oh no! Don't even worry about it. You're so busy. I was so rambling. Yeah. It's so hard sometimes. Like my brain is. I'm so focused on the grant and so like it's like I yeah wish I should have been the, a little bit more centered but the thing is even if you weren't also working on this grant you you also about this topic you have so much to say you know and and so I can imagine that when you're thinking something comes there's all these associations that sort of leap at you going but you can also add this and this and this and this and this right and, and that's the second you have to choose and I know what you mean so, but I think, I think you did great. I thought you did great too. You're, yeah. you're a fabulous speaker. You can't tell you're an introvert at all. No. <laughs> no you did. 
well that's fine. good in my little room without leaving yeah. the <laughs> it's kind of perfect for me <laughs> for sure absolutely yeah oh i think we're still recording where did uh, rachel go okay i think that that doesn't turn